more importantly, uh, for more than a decade now. And uh, really, my work in the tinnitus world began kind of really simply as a way to just share my own story and my personal struggles with tinnitus, along with the the strategies and the tools that I had found that helped me to, to get relief. Um, but I've now worked with nearly a thousand other tinnitus patients one on one, and and so my my thinking and understanding about tinnitus and the strategy strategies I teach and overall approach uh, has just continued to evolve and and grow. And and here I am, eight years later, and and finding myself in a career of helping people, and it's it's been uh, an amazing journey. Excellent. Well, let's get things started. Um, just as a quick precursor. Um, my name is Ben Thompson. I'm the host of the Tinnitus Relief Summit by Treble Health. Welcome. And you can see here a schedule for today's events. Um, just so you know, all this is recorded. We will make sure to get this to you here in the next week. Tonight, we have first Glenn Schweitzer, followed by Dr. Hubert Lim, and then a presentation by myself. So Glenn Schweitzer here will present on tinnitus coping tools, strategies, and techniques. And I want to introduce Glenn by first um, building off of what he just said, that he's an author, he's someone himself who has lived with tinnitus, who has learned techniques to manage and find relief. And then what's great to see, he's been giving that back to the tinnitus community and uh, sees clients one-on-one -on -one as well as is involved with different articles and uh, blog, blog content in the tinnitus online world. So uh, I know Glenn personally, I know he's coming from the right place in the work that he does not only for tinnitus, but also Meniere's as well. Uh, so with that, uh, Glenn, I'm going to pass it to you and you'll have about 20 minutes to present, to bring as much value and help to our live listeners. And then we'll have some question and answer that I will direct. If you are here right now, live on our summit, let us know in the chat um, your name and where you're from. It's gonna be really exciting to see where the 200 of you um, are from. And if you ever have any questions during the presentation for Glenn, there's a section on the bottom called Q&A. You can type those questions in. And if you want them to be specifically for Glenn, you can say for Glenn and then ask your question. We'll get to those at the end. If you have general questions about tinnitus or things that are coming up, you can ask those questions. And we have a few audiologists from Treble Health who are in the chat who can help you out. So with that, Glenn Schweitzer, take it away. All right, <clears throat> so today, uh, I thought I would share a short presentation with all of you on, on uh, what I believe to be a critically important and, and complementary part of every tinnitus sufferer's toolkit, and that's coping tools, uh, strategies, and, and techniques. I know from a lot of the speakers today, you're going to be hearing about habituation and, and research and, and new treatment. So today, I thought I'd sort of complement those other presentations by kind of offering some coping tools and, and, and strategies. Now, Successful habituation, uh, regardless of how you choose to approach it, is a process that generally occurs in stages over time and, and spikes and difficult moments and, and setbacks and difficult days are an unavoidable part of that process. And so when you're going through that process, it can feel like you're taking three steps forward and two steps back over and over again. It can even feel like you're taking three steps back sometimes. Learning to manage those difficult moments is crucial to success. And so it's important to have a lot of effective tools and techniques and strategies to help you better cope along the way. Uh, so today I thought I'd share a few, just a few of my favorite coping strategies that I hope you guys will all find really helpful uh, regardless of where you're at in the, co uh, the habituation process. So, all right, let's dive in. So first, well, when you're first learning to cope with tinnitus, I've, I've found that it's the techniques that improve distraction as well as reduce stress and anxiety. Uh, are, are generally where patients seem to have the most leverage and control early on. And so I wanted to start by sharing a coping strategy that can improve your coping outcomes in virtually any situation or environment. <clears throat> so I call this multi-sensory coping or multi-sensory um, distraction. And the basic idea here is that the more senses and the more of your five senses that you can incorporate into any act of distraction or coping, the greater the likelihood that you will become distracted from your tinnitus. Uh, so in other words, you wanna try to combine coping tools whenever possible, especially relaxation tools and techniques. Um, you can always be doing something with your hands, with your body, with your breath, with your mind, with your, with your ears. And so combining tools whenever possible often leads to a better coping outcome. So for example, um, 
don't just take a hot bath, which can be very relaxing physically. Take a hot bath, put your favorite album on, uh, light an incense or, or a strong scented candle, maybe do some progressive muscle release or a body scan, uh, or, or take deep breaths, do some sort of breathing exercise all at the same time while you're doing the bath. Sort of stack and layer these kind of techniques and, and strategies together. Uh, another example would be don't just go to the park, uh, go to walk around, or rather don't just go for a walk, go to the park and walk around, bring your pet if you have one and listen to an audiobook or even an audiobook and masking at the same time. Uh, don't just play a game on your phone or, or, or browse social media on your phone, browse social media or play a game and listen to a podcast at the same time. One of my sort of go-to combinations for anxiety for myself and, and not so much tinnitus related anymore. Uh, but I, I often will, will find myself playing puzzle games like Tetris on my phone when I'm feeling kind of stressed or overwhelmed or anxious. And then I'll listen to a podcast at the same time. So sort of one part of the mind can, can focus on the game. And then the other part of the mind is sort of actively listening to, to the content. And between the two, it's, it's, there's let, little, very little room left um, to have any kind of negative thoughts or anxiety. So I find that combining tools whenever possible um, is always going to be really helpful and lead to better outcomes. And, and a helpful way to conceptual conceptualize this idea, um, it, there's something that Dr. Ben, I've, I've heard him say many times, uh, which it's an, an analogy for tinnitus that I, that I love so much, which is I've heard Ben say many times that tinnitus is like being in a pitch black silent room and somebody's shining a bright flashlight in your eyes. It's all you can see. It's all you can think about. It's all you're going to notice. Um, masking is, as Ben says, is sort of like turning lamps on throughout the room. You can still see the flashlight, but you can see everything else now. And so the signal in your eyes is reduced. It's easier to manage. It's easier to cope. And I, and I love this analogy. <clears throat> what, I'm, what I'm describing here, though, in this sort of multi-sensory approach kind of takes that a step further. To, it's sort of like inviting all of your family and friends over into that room for a night of dinner and, and drinks and, and, and dancing and celebration. You could choose to look at that flashlight if you want to, but there's so much going on in that room, you're probably not going to notice it unless you're deliberately looking for it. Uh, and so once again, the, 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 more, um, the more tools and techniques you kind of combine and incorporate, the greater the likelihood you will actually become distracted and start to calm down in an act of, of distraction or coping. Also, one sort of final tip with this, in my experience, it's always best when you're trying to cope or with, with a relaxation technique or a distraction or a combination in this way to hold your effort for longer than you think it will take. Uh, oftentimes when we're trying to become distracted from the tinnitus or trying to use a relaxation technique or a breathing technique to, technique to calm down, it doesn't just happen immediately. Like it takes time with continuous relaxation effort before you'll start to experience the relaxation. And the hard part is sticking with the effort when it's not working yet. And so a helpful way to think about this, like one sort of example I often use with my coaching clients is it's, it's sort of like when you're sitting in a car and <clears throat> you're looking down at your phone or reading a book and the driver has to slam on the brakes or, or, or swerve to avoid an accident. Now the driver was in full control uh, at all times. Um, you were never actually in danger, but if you're not looking, it, it can certainly feel like you're about to get in an accident. And I know at least for me, I'll get like a big adrenaline dump and, you know, you look up and you'll realize you're safe immediately in that moment. But the adrenaline doesn't just flush out of the bloodstream instantaneously. It takes like a good couple of minutes, maybe five to 10 minutes before the adrenaline can start to clear out and you can fully start to calm back down. This is happening all the time when we're in fight or flight and having these sort of anxiety reactions to tinnitus. And so holding those relaxation and coping efforts longer than you think you need uh, can often lead to uh, better outcomes. So, okay, that is multisensory coping or, or multisensory distraction, as I like to call it. So that's the first strategy I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, so the next strategy I want to talk about is something that I call preventative coping. Now, <clears throat> Most tinnitus coping tools and strategies are designed to alleviate suffering after a difficult moment has occurred in a, in a reactive sort of a way. Um, but there's another way to approach coping, which is to try to prevent difficult moments from happening in the first place. And with a little bit of planning, you can use the same kind of tools and techniques that you normally use to help you better cope when you're having a difficult time to prevent that difficult moment from happening, or at least to minimize its impact. And so the idea for this it all starts with the fact that <clears throat> I've, I have found that it's very difficult for people to identify 
their unique tinnitus triggers. There's some big ones like stress and anxiety and sleep deprivation and loud sounds that, that affect everyone. But beyond that, it can be very it can be very challenging to, to point to something definitively in your life, some sort of dietary factor or environmental factor, and say, <clears throat> you know, this, this thing makes my tinnitus worse every time. But what's not as difficult to figure out are what I call or refer to as broader patterns of vulnerability. So this would be like times of day, certain types of situations, um, certain types of environments, not where you're guaranteed to have a difficult moment, but where you're much more likely to have some sort of, of difficulty, where you're more vulnerable to having a spike or difficult moment or, or anxiety. And when these patterns emerge, the result is almost always anticipatory anxiety. So for example, let's say Every day when you get home from work at 5 p.m., like that's a time where you tend to struggle and have anxiety and, 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 and are struggling to cope with your tinnitus as you come home from the workday and get in the house. If that's happening every day, then at four, when 4.30 rolls around and you're still working, you're going to start to think about it. And, and all it takes is just one negative thought that can kind of initiate this sort of chain reaction of anxiety that can manifest that difficult moment. So it's, you know, all, all it takes, you could be having a great tinnitus day. And all it takes is that one thought of like, oh, wow, like what a great day. Like, I hope that five o'clock thing doesn't happen. And that's enough anxiety to kind of set that uh, ball into motion. And it becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's often transitionary points during the day where we see this sort of thing happen. These, pat these sort of patterns emerge, like going from, you know, work to home, home to work, sleep to wake, wake to sleep, um, you know, between activities when there's like a lull and in sensory input and we have a chance to stop and notice these sort of moments and notice our tinnitus. And if you can identify some of these patterns, the strategy is to use a very simple coping routine ahead of time, like, and the coping tools ahead of time before the difficult moment occurs. So at 4.30, you would use the coping tools then to boost your defenses. And you're using the tools at a time where you probably don't need them. So you wouldn't have thought to use them otherwise. And the coping tools I recommend in situations like this are the same kind of coping tools that people use after the fact to alleviate suffering and, and stress and anxiety when it's already there. So things like meditation, breathing techniques, uh, relaxation techniques, mind-body techniques, massage. Um, but to, you, to, to use them ahead of time to try to boost your mental and emotional and psychological defenses as much as possible to hopefully eliminate that, that difficult moment from occurring, but at the very least to minimize its impact. Now, now sometimes, just using one tool or technique preventatively can be enough. You know, you just put, even if you're having a great day and you don't feel like you're, you're not wearing maskers, let's say, and you just, you, you don't feel like you need masking that day, just putting on masking at 4.30 so that when that five o'clock time rolls around, if you do notice it, part of the volume is being covered and it's not, it's not going to be the same sort of impact that it might have been otherwise. Other times it'll be a combination of things. Maybe you put on, you know, you do a meditation or, or stop working, take a break, do some sort of breathing technique or a meditation, um, you know, followed by masking for the next couple of hours. And then maybe you do something else to relax when you get home. It's not, it's not so much about like a specific tool or technique. It's, it's, it's meant to be like a new way to think about the tools and techniques that you're already using to try to prevent those difficult moments from happening in the first place. And so on a very surface level, <clears throat> if you can avoid a single difficult moment from happening one time, that's a good enough reason to think about this and kind of assess your own life and, and try to put some thought and energy into figuring this out for yourself. Um, but on a deeper level, if you can avoid a difficult pattern and problematic moment enough times in a row, you can often eliminate that pattern of vulnerability entirely. So if you go two weeks straight or a week straight or, or longer, where you get home from work and you're not thinking about your tinnitus and there is no anxiety or difficult moment, you're going to stop anticipating it, stop expecting it. And oftentimes that moment can just be eliminated. Not in every case, but it, it's something I've seen over and over again in uh, with my tinnitus coaching clients over the years. So that is my preventative coping strategy. So I, I hope you guys will give that one a try too. Uh, I like this one because you don't really need to learn anything new. It's just about shifting the timing and the use of the tools that are already working effectively for you. Uh, okay, so for the final coping strategy that <clears throat> I wanted to talk with you guys about today, it's I find that it's, it's, it's helpful at any point in the process, but it's particularly helpful for people who have started to make some progress with habituation and, and that are coping uh, a bit better than they were before and starting to live more fully, but maybe still struggling with their tinnitus some of the time or, or even a lot of the time. Um, and <clears throat> so, so it all starts with this idea that in the beginning, when your suffering is at its highest point, simply noticing the sound of your tinnitus is something very bad happening. It, it, it triggers like this visceral 
like emotional anxiety, physiological response. I always, I kind of, I describe it to my, my clients as sort of like the universe sucker punching you in, in the stomach. It's like this visceral thing that kind of comes out. Um, but as you start to make progress with habituation and the emotional response starts to improve, it, it, it offers a chance to stop for a minute and check in with yourself. So the strategy is when you, when you notice your, moment, your, your tinnitus and it pops into your mind, stop for a minute and assess, check in with yourself, sort of assess, am I feeling anxiety? Am I feeling any muscle tension, a change in breathing? Am I having negative thoughts? Am I feeling any kind of reaction happening here at all? Uh, because if the answer is no, then nothing happened. Now, the problem is that because simply noticing the tinnitus meant something or, or was something very bad happening for such a long time, there's like a residue there that, that will persist. And so even as you make progress, simply noticing your tinnitus at a, in a moment can will just sort of on a gut level feel like something bad is happening to you. Um, but if you can notice in that moment that it's not bothering you and you're not activating, simply acknowledge it and then try to get back to whatever you were doing. Try to go back to work or get back to your day. It's likely that your attention will bounce off of it at some point in, in the near future. Now, of course, it is always still possible that you will notice your tinnitus and start to react That's and, and have a negative response. Like this is true at, every, at, at any point in the process, that's possible. Even after you've habituated, life happens, spikes and, and difficult moments can happen post-habituation. Um, and if you start, if, if you notice your tinnitus and you are reacting, in my opinion, the, the best question you can ask yourself there is what tool or technique or strategy can I use right now to try to calm down and deal with this moment? Speed to tools is like a core meta skill that I think is very helpful in, in, in the process of habituating. Shorting, shortening the time between noticing, getting better at noticing the moment when your reaction is starting, and then shortening the time between that noticing moment and the using of a coping tool or a technique. Like the faster you can act with a coping technique before you try to get back to whatever you were doing, you have to deal with the anxiety pattern that's playing out. If you try to just push it out of your attention, it's it's very likely that you're you're gonna it's you're gonna fail because your nervous system sort of redirects your attention to what it perceives as the source of the stress you're under. Um and so Choose speed to tools is the th is is the answer to that to there. So what what coping tool or technique can I use as quickly as possible to deal with this moment? Now the other thing that starts to happen a lot more as people make progress is they'll notice the tinnitus. They'll notice that they're not having anxiety or a visceral sort of emotional response, but you start to have negative thoughts. I, I think if this is like the next iteration of in the of the problem of tinnitus in the habituation process, you'll think things like why me, why now, why today, why this, why that. Um, and the reality of negative thinking is you can very quickly think your way into a full-on emotional state, an anxiety state. And I'll just give you a, just a quick example uh, of another place where this, this happens in our lives. Like, Im imagine you, you guys are going for a run, like, and not just an easy run, but like a full-on sprint, like exercise. You're sprinting as hard as you can. Think of the physical sensations you'll experience while you're doing that. Heart racing, heart pounding, burning in the legs gasping for air, sweat coming out of every inch of your skin. These are all terribly unpleasant sensations. But in the context of going for a run, you don't feel like something bad is happening to you. But okay, you go for the run, you come home, you go to bed. Now imagine you woke up in the middle of the night feeling those identical sensations. You wake up in a puddle of sweat, your heart's racing, you can't catch your breath, your legs are burning. It would be the scariest thing that's ever happened to you. You'd think you're dying. You'd call an ambulance, you'd probably say goodbye to your family. Um, and though this is an extreme example, on a very basic level, the only difference be between the, the only difference between how you're feeling when you're running and how you're feeling in the middle of the night is the story you're telling yourself about what those sensations mean, the thoughts you're having. And so this is something we do in all ways and in all parts of our life. And so for tinnitus negative thoughts, here is a very simple but hugely effective, in my opinion, um, cognitive reframing technique to change the emotions of that experience. When you notice your tinnitus and you're starting to have negative thoughts, simply ask yourself, how long has it been since I last felt this way and heard and, and had these thoughts? Because if you just noticed it, a change occurred. You went from not noticing it and being distracted for some period of time to noticing it and starting to have these negative thoughts. Figure out precisely how long of a period of time that was. Maybe it's been uh, 
five, you know, five minutes, half an hour, a day, a couple, a couple hours, however long it's been, it immediately changes the nature of that moment because the default thoughts that come are like, no matter how much work I do, I can't seem to get away from this. It keeps coming back and ruining my life and my day. But if you can suddenly notice like, wow, four hours just went by and I didn't think about it once, that changes it into the noticing of something profoundly positive, the noticing of progress. And you can't really even notice those sorts of distractions until you have it, until it's back in your attention and you look backwards with hindsight. So just very simple sort of exercise. And you can do it when it's bothering you as well. Just how long has it been since I last felt this way? Uh, and, and that often can sort of start to short circuit some of the emotions that would normally come in that moment. So, okay, th those are the three coping strategies that I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, I hope you guys find this helpful and, and give some of these a try. Uh, if anyone wants to connect with me, feel free to email me. I, 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 I'm always right back. I'm Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, -E -N, at, at uh, rewiringtinnitus.com. Or if anyone's interested in, in working with me and my, my tinnitus coaching program, uh, you can find all my information at rewiringtinnitus.com. Thank you so much, Glenn. We all have right. our first we have our first question, and our first all question right. is from Kyle. So Kyle asks, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. So um, I'll do my to best to give you short to, and sweet answers to a, to a few sentences. So Kyle asks, how do you think about these coping strategies in the support of habituation, and what would you say are the most important things on the path to habituation? Okay, so in I'll, I don't know if I can answer that in a couple questions, but I'll, I'll do my best in a couple sentences, but I'll do my best. So I think coping strategies and tools are, are crucially important because this process does take time. It's very up and down. It's never linear. Um, and having the ability to deal with spikes and difficult moments along the way is incredibly important and, and also important because spikes can happen after you habituate and being able to manage those moments so you don't relapse out of habituation and have to start over again. Like this is all very important. Now, what do I think are the most important elements in habituation? I'm I'm going to answer that not with with coping tools or or strategies specifically, but I, I would I would say it's having the ability to catch yourself when you're starting to react, catch yourself quickly, having the right skills and tools uh, to help you cope with those moments. But even more importantly than that, it's having confidence in your ability to use those tools and strategies effectively like confident to me powerlessness is the root emotion at the core of every problematic case of tinnitus it's not fear or anxiety all of that comes from powerlessness confidence in your ability to cope effectively is the opposite of powerlessness it is the antidote to powerlessness and i'll take it one step further i think that confidence in your ability to cope is directly correlated with how fast your attention can bounce off of your tinnitus when it has your attention. Um, and so having some sort of dedicated like relaxation practice or masking program or meditation practice to facilitate habituation, the right uh, skills and, and, and coping skills and tools, and then the confidence in your ability to use them. And you get confidence by using them and going through these difficult moments. Every time you have a spike and you think, oh my God, I can't live like this. This is a nightmare. I'm starting all over again only to come out of that spike and realize that you haven't gone backwards, you're a little bit more resilient than you were before. You'll, you'll remember that the next time. You'll be a little bit more quick to cope. And so really, if there was a way to teach this process where people made linear progress, I would choose not to because they would miss out on the sort of confidence building nature of going through these sort of difficult ups and downs. So uh, hopefully that Excellent. answers your question. Excellent. Thank you. And Kyle, I hope that answers your question as well. It certainly was a great information. Um, next question here is from Tammy. So building on your presentation today, Glenn, um, Tammy asks, what would you Sorry advise, what, would, what advice do you have for me to maintain my physical health without triggering spikes? Everyday things like exercise, even walks can trigger a, an increase or a fluctuation in tinnitus for Tammy. And she's wondering, sure. uh, based on your experience, how to maintain physical health and well-being uh, yeah. without triggering those spikes. So, so that's, that's a great question. Um, I think Meniere's comes to mind when I, when I, when I hear that question, because oftentimes with, with Meniere's, you can, you, you live with a lot of unwanted limitations and potentially physical limitations and disability. Um, I think the answer comes with 
both it's it's one it's 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 knowing yourself and and just having the experience knowing so so this ties into like if you understand what your triggers are you can you can take steps to avoid them understanding what your limitations are and and working within those limitations um and then but also i would say like always be willing to test the boundaries too like i find that when we're living with tin, people when people are when anyone's living with tinnitus we we tend to make our world very small and we sort of confine ourselves in this small little box where you know we stay home we avoid places we say no to things because we can cut when, when we're in this small little place we can control the variables and feel more comfortable but as people make progress and, and start to habituate the walls of that box expand and then oftentimes i find people will hold themselves in that small space out of fear like a, after they no longer need to be there so it's one it's it's knowing your limitations but also always be willing to like reassess and check your limitations. Like if, if you had to avoid something before, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have to avoid it forever. And as far as exercise goes, like there are so many different approaches to exercise, approaches to fitness, finding somebody who can teach you, like who can work with you, like a personal trainer who can understand your limitations and teach strategies or, or approaches, you know, like you can do yoga in a chair. You can you can go for a walk on a treadmill and hold on or, or sit on a recumbent bike or even just get like pedals that you put under your chair at home. Like there's all sorts of small ways we can start to improve our health. And then you can focus on other parts of your health too. Improving sleep, reducing like uh, lifestyle stress and, and environmental stress. Um, health, being healthy is more than, than just exercise. And it's important to address all those different facets. Thank you so much, Glenn. And, you know, this is this is football week here. It's uh, Super Bowl week, so they say football is a game of inches. Well, <laughs> I think tinnitus can be a game of inches as well. That's, and that's for sure. People also describe it as an ultra marathon. So, yes. finding little ways to improve your well-being ten percent here, hundred percent percent there, five percent yep. here. It compounds and it makes a big difference in the long term. Um, another question here is from. Oh, let me pull this up for one second. Another question here is about um, sound sensitivity and hyperacusis, a topic that uh, we're very passionate about. Uh, in fact, many people with tinnitus don't realize they have this. Uh, if it yeah. sounds like running water, dishes clanking, forks and knives, uh, driving in a car, dogs <clears> barking, <throat> if any of those kind of sounds are too sensitive, um, since you develop tinnitus or otherwise, uh, you may have hyperacusis. And uh, the question here for you, Glenn, is uh, Diane asks, I have hyperacusis which makes my tinnitus louder when there's a loud noise that triggers it. Right. Do you have any coping tools for hyperacusis and tinnitus together? Yes. Uh, I will say that I am not an expert on this. Uh, I have worked with many patients with hyperacusis um, and I, I'll, I'll sort of give you my thoughts. So sound sensitivity, as you say, Ben, is, is far more common than people realize, uh, than tinnitus patients especially realize. And that's, that's, it's very often that I'll be working with someone and they won't realize that what they're describing is sound sensitivity, um, but it is. Uh, so the, the, the habituation strategy that I teach to my clients is sort of this meditation uh, based approach. Um, and what I find is that regardless of what you're doing, like incorporating some sort of relaxation practice into your habituation program is going to be the most therapeutic thing first off, because habituate, uh, uh, hyperacusis, it's your nervous system essentially becoming is, is overreacting to these external sounds and causing this oversensitivity in the auditory system. Um, and all, what I have, what I've seen is just by helping people to habituate and calm, calm anxiety and stress and re, and their emotional response to tinnitus, I'll often see sound sensitivity improve to some extent. It, it might be a small extent, just doing nothing, just working to calm down around the tinnitus. But when, when extra tools are needed, um, there's a few things I recommend. So one um, is with masking, um, you know, ha when you have sound sensitivity, masking can becomes difficult because it might, a lot of masking sounds might be triggering. Um, and I, my argument to people is just because you haven't found a sound that works for you yet, doesn't mean that there isn't one that exists. And then volume, the, the volume setting for masking changes too, because I, I have found that I know that having like a, a lower, a very low level of masking to just sort of keep the auditory system activated so that sounds are not essentially punctuating the veil of silence. When, when you hear a, a sudden sound that's triggering in silence, it, it'll light up the nervous system so much more than hearing that sound when you're already hearing other sounds. And so often the masking strategy can change a bit. Um, 
And then never, the last thing I'll say, because I know we're running out of time is don't, you don't want to just become sound avoidant and use more and more earplugs, even though that feels like it's giving you comfort when you're using plugs all the time, you're, you're, you're further sensitizing your system because your nervous system will start to react to quieter and quieter sounds. And so it's really about trying to calm the response rather than avoid sound. So things like musicians' earplugs, things where you can reduce decibel level, but without blocking sound entirely, that's another thing I recommend often. But again, this is not my prior, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in, in hyperacusis. I know you guys uh, are probably much more knowledgeable than, in, than I am. Thank you. Yeah, you definitely touched on the important points of hyperacusis, the having sound therapy that helps treat hyperacusis and being cautious about earplugs and also the the mental emotional stress reduction techniques uh, that that yeah. is, covers a lot of this so everyone we want to give a big thanks to glenn schweitzer of rewiring tinnitus and author columnist involved in our community uh, glenn for those who want to learn more about your work where can they find you yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can find everything at my my website, rewiringtinnitus.com. You can find my book on Amazon. I, I wanted to make it free today, uh, but for reasons that were completely outside of my control, I couldn't. In the next day or two, it will be free. The ebook will be free on Amazon worldwide for the next five days in honor of Tinnitus Awareness Week. This is something I do uh, every year at least once. So please feel free to go check it out if you haven't read my book yet and feel free to reach out to me directly, Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, at rewiringtinnitus.com if you're interested in, in working with me, if you have questions, you just wanna connect. I'm always happy to connect with everyone and, and answer questions when I can. Thank you so much, Glenn, everyone. Let, let Glenn know in pleasure. the chat that you appreciated this talk. And uh, up next here, we have uh, Dr. Hubert Lim. So Dr. Lim is the Chief Science Officer with uh, Neuromod Devices. And before we get into your presentation, Dr. Lim, I want to give a quick update about the schedule here for the Tinnitus Relief Summit. So uh, as we can all see here on the screen, this is Wednesday's schedule. And we've now completed our first four sessions and they've all been outstanding. Um, these will be recorded. We'll get these available to you guys as soon as possible. Uh, we just saw Glenn Schweitzer and now we're switching to Dr. Hubert Lim, PhD of Neuromod for a discussion on the science about bimodal stimulation for tinnitus. So I know Dr. Lim personally and have been introduced to him over the years. And number one, we want talented researchers to be focusing on tinnitus. So we're very grateful and honored that Dr. Lim has chosen to do so. And number two, we we want to learn about possible new methods of treatment, new methods of management. Um, we want the best solution possible for tinnitus. So Dr. Lim and his team have been trying to solve that problem on you know, clinical trials, on humans, on animal models. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Hubert Lim to our presentation for about 20 minutes. And then we'll have a live Q&A moderated by myself, Ben Thompson with Tribal Health. So Dr. Lim, welcome and take it away. All right, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson for the nice introduction and opportunity to be part of your uh, Tennis Relief Summit. I'm gonna share my slides here. Um, hopefully absolutely see if this Please. works. Did that work? Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Looks great. Yep. We see the bimodal okay. neuromodulation for tinnitus and take it away. Okay, great. Um, so, so today I thought I would, uh, share more of an overview of bimodal neuromodulation, uh, for tinnitus treatment. I know uh, many of your audience here have heard about it. Um, I rarely get to dive into some of the detailed science behind it. Um, I, I'm going to try to keep it light, uh, not to be too sciencey, uh, but I thought this would be a good, um, you know, event to share that with your audience uh, and also to share data, clinical data, uh, not just what I've been involved with, but multiple groups, independent groups working on bimodal neuromodulation. I think it's always uh, exciting, encouraging when you see uh, positive and consistent results uh, with uh, different groups uh, working on the same topic. Now, each group has, you know, subtle variations in uh, how they're implementing it and proposed mechanisms of action, but uh, all in all, um, you know, they're, they're implemented in, in, in similar ways uh, and uh, showing encouraging results. So that's the goal for today. Now, before I begin, uh, you know, I am part of the University of Minnesota and it's important that I, uh, you know, have my disclosures. Uh, as, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, I, I am part of Neuromod Devices, 
uh, as a secondary role uh, to my university role, I have financial interest. So that needs to be um, presented here, um, uh, you know, to, to your audience. Uh, I'm also part of another company, Segway Systems, that will not be relevant for today's talk. Uh, it's been fortunate that I was able to uh, get data from multiple groups that they allowed me to share, uh, from Neuromod Devices, of course, but also from Hanover Medical School in Germany, that they were able to have real-world data with bimodal neuromodulation. And most recently, uh, Dr. Rich Tyler, which many of you know, uh, presented on bimodal neuromodulation with a Bose Corporation device uh, that uh, he was able to share a few slides. I kept it short, though, that I will also present uh, data from University of Iowa. Uh, the outline here, uh, as I mentioned, talk about bimodal neuromodulation concept, uh, present some clinical data with the linear device, uh, clinical trials and real world data. I'll get into the University of Iowa findings. And then uh, there was some published data uh, from University of Michigan with Dr. Susan Shore with bimodal neuromodulation. Then we can open it up to questions. So the real question uh, for your audience is why bimodal neuromodulation? Um, and you know, I, I just want to simplify it down uh, in, in a sense that uh, there's two modalities that I think of here that, that are quite encouraging. You have sound therapies or sound devices, and those can, as we know, can be effective for many individuals. They aren't in the clinical guidelines, you know, what's recommended, not because they're not effective, but there's certain kind of clinical trials and data that has to be collected for it to be in, in guidelines. Uh, but it can be effective. Uh, it's convenient to use and uh, can be taken home and many people uh, feel comfortable using them. Uh, however, they may not be effective or, or have a large enough effect, therapeutic effect for uh, many individuals and the effects may be transient, right? On the other side, you have uh, psychotherapy, cognitive, you know, behavioral approaches. Uh, you're gonna see uh, Dr. Uh, Jasserboff uh, talk, uh, I know tomorrow uh, and some other kind of habituation techniques have been topics of, of the summit. Um, those are in the clinical guidelines. They can be quite effective and long lasting, um, though there is some commitment and, and time period for those effects to you know, take, take effect. So what we're thinking here is, is there a way to merge you know, the best of both worlds? Can we uh, create something that can drive stronger changes in the brain, but almost still represent it, you know, itself as, as a convenient uh, option, like a sound device, right? And in order to uh, approach this and, and try to figure out how to enable this to uh, improve, uh, you know, the bothersome level or the tinnitus awareness to reduce the tinnitus awareness, uh, awareness to the tinnitus, uh, the question is how do we approach that? And here, what I'm going to show you is just a very, very simplified schematic of, of how we think tinnitus could be coded in the brain. And then I wanted to go through a few slides to give you a sense of how bimodal neuromodulation may work. Uh, to, to reduce the bothersome level or the awareness to tinnitus. So here you have your brain. Uh, sound enters the ears and vibrates uh, middle ear bone structures and, and the fluids in your cochlea, the snail looking object here. And that causes activation along your auditory nerve that goes to your brain stem, up through your midbrain thalamus, you know, uh, up to your auditory cortex. So there's a pathway, auditory pathway, and it's gonna allow you to perceive sounds. Now, many individuals, uh, I, for me, I believe most individuals have some form of hearing loss that, that have tinnitus. Uh, some of this is very mild or in very high frequency regions, uh, but due to this um, uh, reduced input into the brain uh, for a subpopulation of individuals, there is this um, gain. Now, what we define as gain, we're just using you know, the word gain, but a lot of it's quite complicated and what the brain could do to increase that gain, but it can actually increase the loudness, somehow of, of a sound that's created, or it can make you more aware of a sound that's being coded in your brain. But the idea is that there is this increased uh, uh, perception or, or awareness to what we call this tinnitus percept. Now, the question is, how do we shut that down? The loudness, but also the awareness emotion related to it. Now we know sound approaches can be effective in interacting with the tinnitus cells in your brain. Uh, we know that because if you play sounds, it can mask your tinnitus, it can interact and even cause some residual uh, decrease or, or residual effects on your tinnitus over time. Now, the thing is, is how do we make that more strong, more potent, right? Uh, to make it a larger effect or a longer lasting effect. And this is where the concept of paired stimulation comes in, where you would take your sound, present it to interact, but then reinforce it with another non-sound input. And that could be, for example, electrical stimulation of the body. And in a very simplified way, 
we would view this as, you know, reducing awareness as some kind of super sound therapy. And then that's kind of a simplified way that I, I could present it is that think of it, you have sound therapy, but now we're just creating an enhanced sound therapy approach. So the next question then becomes, would this even work? You know, what, what data or what evidence do we have over time, you know, over the you know, uh, past research that bimodal neuromodulation can work for tinnitus treatment? Now there's already been uh, over a hundred years of research doing paired stimulation to alter things in the brain and your awareness to different things uh, from behavioral effects, which I'll get into with the Pavlonian dog. Many of you are familiar with the dog that becomes sensitive to a bell that's paired with food. Um, but there's also in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, evidence in the auditory brain that you can change coding of cells in your auditory brain directly by doing paired stimulation and in systematic ways. So I'll present some of that as well. And then the last bit here is more in the last decade, a few groups, including my group, have been trying to figure out um, connections uh, that you can actually access, not only sound, but for example, body stimulation that could tap into these pathways that could interact with uh, regions relevant for tinnitus. And that has been work uh, that I'll present, uh, that I've been involved with. So let's jump to the Pavlonian dog here. Uh, everyone's familiar, hopefully, with uh, the Pavlonian dog. Uh, you have this dog here that if you present food, it'll salivate. If you present this bell, it will not care about this meaningless bell. Now, if you combine both of them together, you present the food, you present the bell at the same time, then the dog's brain creates this association with the food and the bell. So next time when the dog hears the bell, the dog will salivate even though the food's not there. Now, interestingly, it can work with lots of different stimuli. And in these studies, you know, over 100 years ago by Dr. Pavlov, uh, even the staircase, walking up the staircase, the sound of that uh, made the dog salivate because a dog associated that food, that strong reinforcer, right, uh, with that bell. So you can make your brain more sensitive to something that it was not too, you know, sensitive before. Now, you may wonder, what does that have to do with tinnitus? Uh, I, I kind of like what um, Glenn was talking about earlier in his talk was, you know, get out there and try to allow your brain to focus on different things. Now imagine if you can make your brain focus on different things and become more sensitive, and then you train your brain automatically so that it keeps focusing on different things and less so of the tinnitus. So you can imagine here if you make your brain sensitive or more attending to all these different stimuli that you present to it in a reinforced way, then indirectly or inherently, it has to decrease its attention to the tinnitus. So that's, that's the, the premise of where we're gonna move towards. Now, I, I like this plot. I know it's dense, but it's one of my most you know, favorite and, and exciting plots that I came across as a, as a scientist during my PhD days at University of Michigan. This was uh, uh, results by the late Dr. Weinberger. There's multiple groups that, that do this kind of research. But what they did is they, they took animals, guinea pigs, and they recorded from cells in the auditory cortex. And this is where we believe uh, at least some forms of the tinnitus are being coded. And what they did is they recorded from this cell in the auditory cortex. And these cells in your auditory system like different frequencies. We say in your brain that the cells are ordered based on what frequency sounds they like. And this is not only for the auditory system. If you think about your visual system, you have cells that like certain locations of your visual scene. Your body, you have cells that code for your finger, that code for your leg. So there's this topographic map of cells. So if you look at a cell in the auditory cortex, this one cell might like one kilohertz sounds. And so let me guide you through this plot here. If you look at the X axis, this is different frequencies that we're presenting. So you could present a 100 hertz sound or 0.1 kilohertz, a 200 hertz sound, a one kilohertz sound, a 10 kilohertz sound, you know, 20 kilohertz. And on the Y axis, you don't have to worry about, you know, the, the complexity there is except that up means that the cell likes it better. Okay, so then you have this green curve and you play 200 hertz, you play 400 hertz, you play one kilohertz sound, you know, like a piano, you're kind of going up the piano here. You play one kilohertz and this neuron loves that sound. You could see it's, it's very high. The green curve is very high, high number. And then as you go to higher frequencies, it doesn't care so much. When you play 10 kilohertz, the neuron doesn't fire much. It, it doesn't have much activity. So we say this cell is tuned or sensitive to one kilohertz. Now, this is what was very you know, exciting and, and, and impressive, is that then what they did was they played 2.5 kilohertz sound 
to the guinea pig's ears while they're recording from this cell and they electrically stimulate the body. You could do this in different body locations. At the same time, they played the 2.5 kilohertz. So they're playing the tone, but they're giving a reinforcement signal to the body. And they only did this 30 times. And what happened then is something that we thought was so fundamental to cells in your brain, you could shift it. You can move these cells to code in different ways. And so what you see is the orange curve. The orange curve, still not that sensitive to 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 400 hertz. Look at this though. It doesn't care as much about the one kilohertz. Interestingly, it cares about the 2.5 kilohertz, the one that you presented and paired the body stimulation to. And then as you go to higher frequencies, it doesn't care so much. So what you notice here are three things that I want you to pick up on. One is you made the cell, its identity change. You, before it loved one kilohertz, now you made it more sensitive to a different frequency, in this case, 2.5 kilohertz. The other piece here is that you made it less sensitive to the original sound. That's exciting because it tells you, you can start shifting these cells in systematic ways by pairing the inputs. We call this homeostasis. Your brain can't be sensitive to everything. And why I would also argue Glenn's comment about distracting yourself, your brain can only be sensitive or focused to a few things at a time. And then the other thing is you, you do get a little bit of excitability overall. As you can see, the orange curve is a little bit higher than the green curve. So that's exciting. Behaviorally, we know this can work. Physiologically in the brain, we know things are changing and it's possible. The big question now is which body regions do we stimulate and how do we implement this in a practical way? And so what we were able to do, because we know that lots of body regions project to the brain, we were able to stimulate lots of different locations in the guinea pig, play sounds, and long story short, we found two regions to be quite effective. The ear region, when you electrically stimulate it with sound and the tongue, if you electrically stimulate the tongue. So these are the two regions I got very excited about and started to pursue in my lab and in partnerships with other labs. So I'm gonna uh, go through this here. I realize uh, time went by quicker, but here's your brain, very abstract view. You have your cells here that are representing the tinnitus in your brain, the triangles. Now, if you play sounds, pure tones, you're going to cause these circle cells to light up and it's going to somewhat hide or mask your tinnitus cells because your brain is kind of being distracted and can't focus on the tinnitus cells and the sound induced cells that are being activated. And it happens with different sounds. And then if you turn off the sound, then what you're going to get is the tinnitus that's gonna remain there afterwards, right? And sometimes you'll get residual effects. Sometimes you'll get things that are altering, but typically they're transient. Now what we're gonna do is use bimodal neuromodulation. We're gonna play the sound and we're gonna pair it with, in this case, tongue stimulation or another body region. And when you do that over and over again, you see the circles, but they're enhanced circles now. They got this, you know, this electrical stimulation symbol. And what you see is that things stick around, things shift. As I showed you before, you're shifting the coding of cells, right? And as you make other cells more sensitive or active, you're going to cause the tinnitus cells to calm down a little bit. And that's because of this comment I made before about homeostasis. Well, you do this again with another tone, another tongue stimulation, and you'll cause this to happen even more. It'll be, the tinnitus will become uh, even less noticeable or you'll be less aware to it. And if you do this over and over again, many, many times, the idea is that eventually you've normalized the tinnitus uh, uh, into a softer, less aware state. So question is, all the science work, all this research, but clinically, does this work? And multiple groups are fortunately pursuing bimodal neuromodulation in various uh, uh, small and large scale studies. Uh, one group of studies, which I'm involved with, is with neuromod devices. Uh, they've been able to pursue so far and publish on two large-scale clinical trials uh, in 326 tennis participants for TENT-A1 and 191 tennis participants for TENT-A2. Um, the first one they demonstrated um, uh, and, and supported the safety and efficacy of using 12 weeks of sound stimulation with tongue stimulation to reduce the symptoms of tinnitus. And from that, we then built upon that knowledge to look at different stimulation settings 
to show that other types of patterns could be effective. But what I think was, uh, for me, the most exciting was that in 10A2, we were able to adjust the stimulation parameters midway and drive further improvements in tinnitus. And this is shown in this data here. I promise not too much uh, complicated data plots, but this one captures the summary of these two studies. Uh, I want to make a, a caution that we are pooling data from different studies. So you have to be a bit cautious in direct comparing, but I, I wanted to provide this data in this format so you could get a sense of, 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 of the kinds of effects you're getting across studies. So if you look at uh, CBT and usual care, this was from a seminal publication or study done by Sima et al. Uh, a few years back, uh, 2012. And you see on the y-axis, it's, it's a tinnitus score, tinnitus handicap inventory. And what you need to know from there is negative means improvements in tinnitus symptoms. You see that for usual care, especially for cognitive behavioral therapy, you are getting an improvement over time. And seven points is what's defined as clinically meaningful. So this is very encouraging. You get this improvement with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, if you look at TET A1 study with bimodal stimulation, the gray curve is when we gave the same stimulation strategy for 12 weeks. Six weeks was synchronous, but it continued on for a second six weeks and we evaluated at six weeks and 12 weeks. Then we took the device back and tracked it for a year after the treatment had stopped. And what you notice here is you get this rapid improvement during the first six weeks that then plateaus off. Even during treatment, you don't get any uh, much additional improvement during the second six weeks and you get the sustained effect. What was interesting though, and encouraging is in 10A2, because of this plateau effect, we actually swapped the stimulation strategy midway. So for the second six weeks of stimulation, and we did in a way that the individuals could not perceive that change. It was done with delays that are imperceptible. And what was exciting you see for the green curve is we're able to drive further improvements in that in the tinnitus symptoms uh, uh, down to about what, what you see here, 21 points, about three times the clinically meaningful uh, uh, improvement. And as you can see, after the treatment stop, it could be sustained. So this gives us a sense that different stimulation settings can be effective, but you got to keep the brain active. You got to, and, and again, to what Glenn was saying, try to you know, imagine keeping your brain on its toes and having it focus on multiple things to be able to keep driving distraction or these improvements. And that's what we're doing here by providing different stimulation settings. And just sometimes when you present tinnitus results with these questionnaires like THI, uh, it's hard to grasp what it means uh, from a qualitative, right, an experience perspective. And so we simply just asked in this uh, most recent study, 10A2, did you benefit from uh, the bimodal treatment, and we had 70% say, uh, yes, they did. Uh, and we asked, would you recommend that they try this treatment to someone who has tinnitus? And we had about 88% for this uh, most recent study. Now, when you're in a clinical trial, the question is, does it translate to the real world in the commercial or clinical setting? And so this was one of the first sites in Europe. It's available in Europe, not yet in the U.S., but in one of the first sites in Europe, they had uh, patients come through. So this is 20 of their first patients that came through their clinic, uh, they received bimodal stimulation, uh, you know, initially the first six to 12 weeks follow-up that they had data for. And what's encouraging is you see the green plot, they had an improvement of about 10.4 points. Now it wasn't as high or as much as we saw in our clinical trial, uh, you know, still pretty close. In our clinical trial, the first six weeks was about 12.9 points improvement. Um, but, you know, you, it's expected because there's greater heterogeneity and complexity in the real world. But this is uh, showing that the real world data can track uh, the clinical trial data. And on the bottom there, you just see that individual patient data, you see on the left side, the green negative, meaning that there was an improvement. You see, you know, different amounts of improvement for each of these bars. Each of these bars is a different patient. And what we found encouraging was that you could see for 10A2, the distribution, the shape of this distribution uh, is not too different from uh, the real world data. So all of this points uh, in the right direction. You know, you've got clinical data supporting this. You've got real world data supporting this. Now the question is, can it be repeated by other groups and other methods, modalities? And the question is so far it appears so, yes. Now this is a different approach. Uh, I was excited to see this when Dr. Rich Tyler presented it uh, last year, last summer. Some of you may have been at that uh, tinnitus and hyperacusis conference. 
Uh, their approach was working with Bose Corporation. Some of you know this Bose headphone, noise canceling headphone. They paired this with a device you see on the bottom left here with electrical stimulation. Um, there's either ear inserts, but they have electrodes that uh, stimulate the, the ear, your ear region. And they provided this for six weeks of stimulation. What's interesting is uh, this is how I would have done it. They took a notch at the tinnitus frequency. So these are the individuals who had tonal tinnitus and they basically presented the electrical stimulation with a broadband noise with a notch where the tinnitus frequency is. And they repeated this uh, 30 minutes per day for six weeks. Uh, and encouragingly, they showed that a majority of the tinnitus participants improved in their tinnitus symptom scores. Now they're using a different questionnaire, but they basically showed in that questionnaire that 10 out of 11 uh, had some improvement uh, five of the 11, so about 50% had a significant clinical uh, lead related improvement. So that all again is pointing in uh, the right direction. I know he has this um, data in publication or in, uh, in, in review. So hopefully uh, you'll all have access to this uh, not too far in the future. And finally, the last data I just wanna share is uh, this was a seminal paper that was published uh, in 2019 um, by Dr. Susan Shore's group, or it might've been 2018, sorry, um, in Dr. Susan Shore's group at University of Michigan. Uh, they are doing electrical stimulation of the face um, or the neck region, uh, trying to tap into some of their earlier research showing trigeminal stimulation. And they are pairing it uh, in the guinea pigs with pure tones, but they've done more uh, complex sound aligned with the tinnitus. Um, and, and uh, adjusting some delays to try to suppress the, the tinnitus loudness. But regardless uh, of the subtle differences in the approaches, they are using bimodal stimulation. And again, here, they provided four weeks of treatment in humans, and they're able to show uh, uh, significant improvements in tinnitus symptoms that could last for at least um, three weeks post-treatment. So I, I think when you take it all in totality, uh, it's quite encouraging for the field. You have multiple groups working on biomodal neuromodulation. Uh, there's you know, subtle, subtle differences in how they're being implemented, but it's showing that bimodal stimulation is causing some changes in the brain, is affecting uh, tinnitus cells, right? Or, or cells uh, uh, interacting with the tinnitus percept. Um, and it has been uh, uh, relatively easy to use or well you know, tolerated to use. So that's exciting. Uh, now there's a lot to be uh, investigated still in terms of stimu optimal stimulation strategies and who best you know, uh, benefits from each of uh, uh, these different uh, stim, stim patterns. Uh, but I think uh, through this presentation, you'll see that, th that there's a lot of potential for bimodal neuromodulation. So uh, all of us are quite excited for where this can be uh, in upcoming years. And uh, hopefully that gives you a good snapshot uh, of the bimodal neuromodulation field. Uh, and with that, I'm open for questions here. Let's give a big thank you to Dr. Hubert Lim for an entertaining and educational presentation. We love when you can combine both of them. Uh, we have a few lightning round questions, so try to keep your answers brief to a few sentences if yep. possible. And for those who still have um, questions, please ask them in the Q&A. There's a few very technical questions that Dr. Lim might encourage you just to hang around for five minutes and answer them yourself in the Q&A so that um, we make sure we're serving everyone the best we can. So the first question sure. here, um, the first, yeah, the first question here was about from Gino. Was about uh, Gino asks, um, I have hearing loss that I developed around five years ago. At the same time, I got tinnitus. Gino wants to know, am I too old to benefit from bimodal stimulation? I'm 73, and I'll I will also ask, are there certain conditions that would make someone a very good candidate for bimodal stimulation, and are there certain demographics or conditions that would make someone um, not a good candidate for this? Yeah, so uh, through all the data that we've collected across multiple studies, uh, and even in the animal data, there isn't any um, data supporting against, you know, that, that it wouldn't work for, for you. Um, there is data, you know, in the plasticity, brain plasticity world, uh, that shows that as things, you know, evolve in the brain, it, it, and gets more situated, it does take more effort and more um, um, activation to shift it back or shift it to another state. It's the same thing when you think about learning another language. So uh, it could take more, more trials or more uh, implementation, but there's nothing to say it couldn't work uh, for, for any of those conditions. Thank you. How about um, different subtypes of tinnitus, um, pulsatile tinnitus, or say um, tinnitus related to my neck or my jaw? Uh, what does the research show with those kinds of subgroups as of now? Yeah, so pulsatile, objective tinnitus, things like that. Um, obviously, if it's more subjective and in the brain, 
uh, that's where uh, they should be more effective. If it's more objective, you know, obviously there's other mechanical or physiological effects that are driving that. So that would be an alternative, uh, you know, to go see an uh, ENT or ear, nose, throat doctor. Uh, in terms of somatosensory or somatic tinnitus, it is an interesting question. I do know that Dr. Susan Shore, um, you know, has has pushed uh, um, her her approach, if I if I recall correctly, on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, you know, targeting those with somatic tinnitus because there obviously is some interaction of the somatosensory system with the auditory system in those patients. So uh, there is the jury still out, but you know there could be opportunities there um, for effectiveness uh, with certain settings, right? But uh, in our data, we haven't seen any clear trends that you have to have somatic tinnitus to, for this to be effective. Thank you so much. And just the last question here: um, Where can someone who wants to learn more about tinnitus research go? Maybe they want to participate in one of these trials if there are active trials. Uh, and then the second question: How can they follow your work uh, and you, from your university work as well as your um, your your work in the professional community? So, so I don't mean to give uh, advertising for Treble Health, but I have to say Treble Health has a lot of good resources. Uh, I've been tracking some of them too. So I, I, I do think that's a good location. For Neuromod devices, uh, you can go to the website, but you know, if, if you'd like, uh, Dr. Thompson, um, I can give you the link there and you can provide it to uh, others. Uh, there's uh, updates on what's going on with progress for Neuromod device. Uh, for myself, you know, at University of Minnesota, I have a website there. And we, we announce some news sometimes. Um, and run some studies. So that's also an option there. But these, these are um, different avenues. Excellent. I just dropped that in the chat. Well, um, for everyone here who's live, and there's over 300 of us, which is great for the Tinnitus Relief Summit, let's give a warm thank you and just uh, you know, extending our praise and gratitude for you and the other scientists um, that you work with for caring about the tinnitus community and putting in years of long research and uh, attention into your work. So thank you so much, Dr. Lim, and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me, uh, and, and hopefully it was uh, helpful to your audience. So uh, thank you, everyone. Have a, have a good evening. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, so if you're here for the Tinnitus Relief Summit, you're in the right place. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Thompson. I am the host. I am coming to you live um, from Treble Health. We are a telehealth company focusing on tinnitus, and we have a group of eight audiologists, licensed audiologists, many of whom are in the chat here today, who are answering questions via the Q&A as well as the chat. Um, I'm now going to give a presentation on the topic that I chose to present on is one that I know many of you may be asking is, is a cure possible? And what kind of treatments are available for my tinnitus? So let's start with my presentation here. If you have questions, please ask them in the live Q&A where myself or other audiologists on our team will answer them. And if you have questions for the general chat, um, please ask them as well. Just know that we are after hours here. So uh, if your questions are not answered immediately, we care about you, we see them. Uh, it just may, may be that some of our audiologists um, have um, you know, ended, their, ended their shift with us. So let's get ahead. Um, is a tinnitus cure possible before 2025 and how to get relief from tinnitus in the next three months? I feel like these two points are so important. What is on the horizon? What should I know? And how can I get relief now? At the end of this presentation, I want you to know today's best research. Dr. Lim just really set the tone here that bimodal stimulation is part of the best research. It's definitely the newest trend in terms of um, a new modality of tinnitus treatment. And we must also remember the foundations and the basics because those are improving rapidly as we get better and better at what we do. So I started to work in the tinnitus niche after I was working at a major hospital in San Francisco, California called UCSF. It's a University of California hospital. I was working in the tinnitus program as an audiology resident and a patient drove four hours from Lake Tahoe in the mountains of California to see me for a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, after about an hour of working together, diagnosing their tinnitus, understanding the cause, explaining what was happening, providing resources and a treatment plan, uh, my patient left that appointment so satisfied after they had already seen multiple doctors, audiologist, and ENT doctor um, in Lake Tahoe, California. So this showed me that the need for better services and better information for tinnitus uh, was very high. And I felt that with technology and with telehealth and eventually the YouTube videos that we could provide a lot of benefit. And now look at us here about three years later uh, presenting the Tinnitus Relief Summit 
2023. And um, this presentation here will be the last presentation of the evening, followed by more presentations tomorrow. Disclaimer, this is very important. Everyone's tinnitus is unique. Make sure you've been medically evaluated by an ENT doctor. Most of research in tinnitus um, right now is not available for you to just go out and buy or for you to go and contact the researcher and just try immediately. So be patient with us and don't jump ahead to wanting something that is not available yet and it's not proven yet. Don't jump ahead to wanting that before you've tried the tried and true methods that work for a majority of individuals. Um, also knowing that in any medical specialty, no treatment protocol has a 100% success rate. So while we can find the best treatment for tinnitus, it's still not going to treat 100% of patients successfully. So we have to acknowledge that uh, we're going to get it as good as possible, but there, there are, tinnitus is a challenging condition and sometimes it's a challenging condition to find uh, you know, a dramatic treatment effect for. So can tinnitus be cured? How do we define a cure? Um, I would say that tinnitus can be cured the research has been going deeper and deeper into this over the decades. Dr. Lim is one of the, the brightest researchers in our field. He was just explaining very well how we can shift the cells in our auditory brain so that after a training period using sounds or using stimulation scientifically, that the brain cells in your auditory brain can change and modify through neuroplasticity. And that shows us that the brain can improve. Well, tinnitus is uh, an effect of the auditory brain. So with certain tr training and changes, the tinnitus itself can improve. So I do believe that a tinnitus cure is possible. I hold that near and dear. How do I define a cure? This one's a little tricky because if I ask 10 people who have tinnitus, what does a cure mean to you? I think some of them would say, it's gone completely, I don't hear it. Others might say, it gets better and I, it's not a problem in my life anymore. When I've met individuals, when we've worked with individuals who have reduced their tinnitus to a point where it's softer and they don't hear it as often and it doesn't affect their life anymore and they're essentially living like it's not there, that's actually how a vast majority of Americans and adults live their life with some low level tinnitus that's there in quiet places but doesn't affect them. So. There is this perspective of, can there be an effective cure for tinnitus? Can we get your tinnitus level to a point where you're living a normal, full and productive life and it's much better? Because to me, that's where we need to focus right now. There is no 100% gone forever cure, but there are effective treatments, effective methods that we should not overlook now. And we should probably try them now if we haven't already. Um, tonight's presentation with me will include bimodal stimulation, touching on hair cell regeneration, injections in the ear, acoustic neuromodulation, other approaches, and then uh, today's leading treatment. So we touched on this earlier, bimodal stimulation. I won't go too deep into it. Two groups to watch in terms of the research are the Michigan tinnitus device and neuromod devices. Um, they have two slightly different approaches. Dr. Lim touched on this in detail. As a collective field, bimodal stimulation is gaining traction and gathering a collection of evidence. In the tinnitus community, it's hard to change the status quo and, and prove that a treatment works for the majority of patients. Trials take time, research takes time. Tinnitus is a tricky medical condition to be, because it's impacted by so many things like stress, sleep, mental health, uh, other medical conditions, medications. So with that, it can be hard to pinpoint and have um, uh, a placebo controlled study. Hair cell regeneration. This is something that um, has been talked about for really decades, honestly. The newest um, excitement in the last few years is a company called Frequency Therapeutics, FX322. Inside of the ear, deep inside the ear, there are these little hair cells and they function like uh, algae in the, in the ocean where they're in this water, this fluid, and based on sound waves that come through the fluid, just like waves that go through the ocean, the algae can bend and change. And over time, as we age with hearing loss and other natural factors, those cells, those hair cells, they lose their function. And hearing loss is one of the main causes of tinnitus. So looking at this research group, the question is, can restoration of those cells in the inner ear, in the cochlea, can that 
improve tinnitus? Can that create an effective cure or can that restore hearing so it brings back tinnitus? At this point, we're not seeing a dramatic positive effect from this group. With this research, there's been certain trials that have seemed promising, other trials that bring our expectations back down to the ground and baseline. So we're monitoring this. Uh, I don't see this as having a leaps and bounds cure or new treatment by 2025. And the reason I put that timeline in this um, in this presentation here is because what we've seen is that for people who have even had bad tinnitus or bothersome tinnitus for seven years, five years, three years, they implement a strategy focusing on what's available right now. And they've seen positive shifts in their tinnitus that can take place in a six to 18 month period. So that's why when, when we, I don't want you to wait for 2025 or later for a cure because it might not come by then. And I want you to get as as well as you can in the interim. Habituation is the goal. We're going to touch on this graph later. It brings us through what are called the four stages of habituation. Stage one and two is where most of you probably are, where your tinnitus is most intense. Uh, frequent worrying, anxiety, constant sound, uh, trouble with sleep. Uh, stage four is when tinnitus is rarely noticed. Uh, it doesn't affect our life and uh, we can live a full and productive life. So getting from stage one or stage two into stage four over weeks and months, that is our goal right now. That is the effective treatment that's available. Anything that helps you with tinnitus is promoting habituation. And that's what we want. The brain is powerful and it can get there right now. Another, another type of research that has been studied is uh, our injections in the ear. So with a syringe and a very narrow needle. I saw this happen uh, when I was working in ENT clinics as an audiologist. Um, with that needle, it can go through the eardrum and it can inject this, uh, this, this material, uh, this, which on the screen here, you'll see the name of it. Um, it can inject this material into the inner ear and that can impact the connections between those little hair cells and the nerves that send sound information, auditory signals up into the brain. Odo313 is a project that was studied um, by these means. Unfortunately, it was um, the research showed that it was not effective when compared to a placebo control group. Therefore, rightfully, the company stopped the production and the further research. Now, it might seem like that's a loss for the community, and we were hopeful that this would lead us somewhere into, for the injections in the ear. But after the recent study, the injections in the ear approach made us, again, come back to our baseline and say, okay, maybe something will come of that later, but in the foreseeable future, we're not expecting something dramatic to happen with Odo313. And with all of these uh, approaches that I'm speaking about tonight, you know, we, we've spoken with our patients, our community who have either tried these, been in the clinical trials, uh, want to try them. So we're very close as a group of audiologists um, to the experience you're going through, which is that you may feel desperate. You may want to try anything. You may want to sign up for a, a trial of any of these studies. And that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to set expectations. Acoustic neuromodulation. This is, uh, instead of triggering a different nerve, the neck, the tongue, uh, the cheek, instead of triggering one of those nerves through bimodal stimulation, which was spoken about earlier tonight, acoustic neuromodulation looks at how do we modulate or change the brain cells by sending targeted sounds into the ear only. This approach was more popular uh, around 2015, 2010. Um, since then, this approach has uh, waned and we're seeing bimodal stimulation as, as a sort of picking up where that left off and excelling into a, a new degree. So acoustic neuromodulation is not something that we are, are recommending to patients. It's not something that uh, we hear many success stories about. And I would say at this point, it seems that it's, um, it's, a, tech, it's a technology or an approach that's becoming less popular. Other approaches which um, may have meaningful uh, outcomes in our community at some point, things that we're keeping our eyes on are electrical and magnetic stimulation of the ear. You can see the image on the right, how someone has uh, a, 
stimulation piece on their ear lobe or ab ab rather above their ear. Um, Extracochlear multi-channel electrical stimulation. Again, this is the actual ear, like Dr. Lim had said. There, there is some um, noteworthy data to support that stimulating the ear, the physical ear, the skin on the ear and such, the nerves that connect to it, how that can uh, be used as a therapy. Although there's nothing in this realm that we are recommending or that we have doctors recommending. So will there be a cure for tinnitus by 2025? My personal opinion is maybe, but probably not. Um, probably the, the newest approach that has research to support it is exactly what Dr. Lim had presented on earlier, bimodal stimulation from various research groups between Europe and the United States. Can you find relief by 2025? Can you have a meaningful change in your tinnitus and live a full and productive life? Absolutely, and that has to be our message because with, without this, then we're simply waiting and delaying. You have power in your decisions this week, this month, the habits you create, the systems you use, the tools you put in place, these can help you in the short term. So that's what we wanna focus on. Habituation, this is a term that we've talked a lot about today. So let me know in the chat if you've been to some of our earlier presentations here on the summit, um, habituation for tinnitus relief follows these four stages. If you do certain things like sound therapy, one-on-one -on -one coaching, cognitive behavioral therapy, stress reduction, mindfulness, many of our most successful patients are using all of them together. When you're doing that in a systematic approach that's guided and directed, you will notice improvements on your stages of habituation. And today that's the best treatment approach that is commonly used. Bimodal stimulation, which was mentioned earlier, something we have our eyes on, but right now it's not commonly used clinically. And that's still in its development in terms of um, the adoption by audiologists and the professional community in the real world clinical setting. So if you have stage one or stage two tinnitus, uh, our goal is to get you to stage four. Many people have done it, a vast majority of people who commit to the program or the plan or use the tools effectively can achieve it. So don't, don't believe that it's too hard or it won't work because I can't have you believe that. It's not in your own best interest. Um, it does take time. So is it fast? Is it quick? No, habituation is not quick. It's an ultra marathon. It's a step-by-step -step approach. It's a game of inches, but it's a game worth playing. It's, you need to stay in the fight on this. Stage four, this is where most, this is, at, there are multiple people who are presenting in this summit who have reached stage four. Multiple audiologists on our team at Treble Health have personally gone through these habituation stages and it's taken between months for them and sometimes over a year. So the timeline here is individual. Don't get attached to how long it will take, but know that in, meaningful improvements can happen in the short to midterm. And those are the improvements that can change your life. So we don't need a cure for your life to get a lot better for your sleep, for your work, for your family, your relationships, attention, concentration, uh, anxiety, stress, a sense of control. All of those things can get better in the short and midterm. Some examples of habituation to sound that we might relate to better than this uh, uh, term, which doesn't have that much meaning to it by itself, Think about the sound of your own breathing. Just stop for a second and take an inhale and an exhale. If your hearing is pretty good, then you should be able to hear the sound of your own breathing. But how often do you hear that in your everyday life, hour to hour, day to day? I personally, every time I stop and focus on it, I notice, oh yes, my breathing, it's there. But otherwise I'm never thinking about it. So the sound is always there, but my brain doesn't attach to it. It doesn't uh, find it. it. It's just a passive way in the background sound. So if your brain can do this for the sound of breathing, I'm telling you that your brain can also do this for tinnitus. Living next to a railroad or a highway. If you've lived through this yourself, you know this is true, that for the first days or weeks, you'll notice that the road noise is very loud. The sound of the train coming by makes you jump off your seat. But after some weeks or months, you think back and you notice, I don't even hear that train that much anymore. Or no, you, you invite a guest over. No, I didn't hear that. This is another example of how the brain 
and habituate to certain sounds. Same approach can be helpful for tinnitus. The sound of your refrigerator humming in your kitchen is an excellent example of this. Living next to an electrical line, a high wire tension line that has a very high pitched uh, ringing, hissing, humming sound to it. People live in apartments next to those power lines, but they eventually don't really hear them anymore. Now, if they listen for it, they will hear it, but it doesn't affect their day to day and it doesn't bother them. I'm not saying this is a snap of the fingers for tinnitus, but hopefully this makes it more uh, you know, real and relatable that your brain can habituate and change and adapt to different sounds. Ear level devices for sound therapy are a big part of habituation. Tomorrow we have the founder of tinnitus retraining therapy and my personal mentor, uh, Dr. Pavel Jastrobov. I pulled some strings to have him join our presentation tomorrow. So I wanna make sure you're there. And after decades and decades of uh, study, him and others in his professional community learn that sound therapy played through ear level devices on the ears is a big reason why you can habituate to your tinnitus. It's not absolutely necessary because other people have habituated without it, but in terms of what helps most people and what will likely help you, that sound therapy approach, it's what we use at Tribal Health. It's what any tinnitus expert audiologist will recommend to their patients. That is a must have, and if you haven't tried it, you should. Sound enrichment during the day and the night. The protocol to follow for habituation in terms of the sound therapy is to never be in silence and to have sound enrichment all the time. This was spoken about earlier, that if, there, if you're in a silent place, your brain latches on to the one sound that it can hear. But if you have sound enrichment, natural music, ear level devices with sound therapy, smartphone apps, playing YouTube uh, sound therapy tracks from your laptop, um, having a sound machine in your room, all of that counts. If you do that during the day and the night until you are at stage four of habituation, then you will notice the process is a lot easier. It sounds very simple. And if, you've, if you're in the chat and you've had success with sound therapy, either for immediate relief or long lasting uh, relief, let us know because it, it's probably the most under communicated piece of what really helps people day to day with tinnitus. Neutral sound in the ears is ideal, neither positive nor negative. So what that means is using pink noise, using white noise in ear level devices is the gold standard for how sound therapy for habituation is programmed. If you have your favorite relaxing music that you always play for your sound therapy, uh, it makes you focus too much on the sound. We want this to be background. We wanna train your brain that background sound is neutral, you don't need to pay attention to it. It's neither a good thing or a bad thing. That's eventually what we want your tinnitus to be, just like the sound of my breathing, just like the electrical line next to the apartment, just like the refrigerator in your kitchen humming. Tinnitus maskers, sound machine, and again, list, having this for most hours of the day, not only when you need it, but proactively most hours of the day. This is the protocol. This is the tinnitus retraining protocol to follow. And if you're committed to this, we see this being a big reason of why patients can move to stage four of habituation. There's two research studies here that show that treating hearing, using hearing devices on the ears support tinnitus management. The research supports that. We have two articles here that are peer reviewed that are saying when hearing devices like hearing aids are programmed specifically for tinnitus, it supports habituation in a way that's been you know, agreed upon based on various researchers. The other piece of this is the emotional, mental, psychological piece of this. If, the, if you've tried counseling or one-on-one -on -one coaching before, um, maybe with someone who's on, maybe with myself, maybe who's someone, someone on our team at Tribal Health, maybe another uh, presenter here at the Tinnitus Relief Summit, if you've tried one-on-one -on -one coaching and counseling and it's helped you before, let us know in the chat because this is something again where it's easy to overlook this and say, oh, I can do this by myself. Well, this method CBT for tinnitus, CBT stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. You can, you, you can do this with a psychologist. That's the gold standard. You can also use techniques of this approach 
with a well-trained audiologist like those on our team or a good coach for tinnitus. Know these things, that tinnitus itself is not dangerous. Tinnitus is not the problem. The reaction to the tinnitus is the problem for why it's so loud and obtrusive. We can train the brain to react less than we will habituate, which most people do learn how to do. Can't stress that enough. Have that North Star that you can habituate and whatever that means for you, where you're at, where you want to be, that's what we want to focus on. So now I'm going to transition into a few slides. Uh, right in the chat, yes, if you'd like to learn about the newest data from individuals in our program. And I see the chat here is very active. Um, I see Carol who says yes. I see Alicia and Heidi who say yes. James, Molly, great. So we have a team of audiologists at Tribal Health. We're focused 100% on tinnitus. We also help with hyperacusis sound sensitivity. Um, I want to show some data and some studies that we've completed on uh, 179 individuals who have completed the tinnitus functional index. This is essentially a measurement of tinnitus from zero to 100. Um, we took that at the beginning of them starting with us, three months later, and then we're going to present data later at a later point on six months later. So typically in the world of tinnitus, we've seen, hey, it takes about six months to have a meaningful change with tinnitus. Well. What we're showing here is that um, in this three month period with 179 individuals, 69% of them had a clinically significant reduction in tinnitus within three months. So we're very proud of this. Most of our patients who work with us have moderate to severe degrees of tinnitus. This means they would rate it as a six, seven, eight, nine, or a 10 out of 10. And we're showing an improvement here uh, within three months. The average reduction was 26 points, which is two times larger than the clinically significant threshold of 13 points. So any respected you know, scientist, audiologist, doctor who sees these numbers would want to learn more about what's going on and how we're getting this, this improvement. Um, our method's a bit different than what other clinics may offer. The main piece of this is we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one care. And when I was thinking about this presentation of what can help you today, what can help you now, um, having one-on-one -on -one care, having the one-on-one -on -one coaching plus the sound therapy, if you haven't tried that, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it really complements everything that's been discussed at this relief summit so far and provides a framework for how to follow these methods. Some other tips, right? So we've spoken so far about sound therapy treatment, the gold standard being ear level devices. We offer those at Treble Health. You can also find those from a local audiologist, but make sure they're well-trained in tinnitus and make sure that they do offer a comprehensive program. Ideally, they're accredited by the American Tinnitus Association, or they are well known for having a comprehensive program for tinnitus. On top of that, sound therapy treatment with ear level devices, we also want you to focus on the one-on-one -on -one coaching to improve things like a sense of control about tinnitus, answering your questions that are keeping you up at night, um, helping identify what is the cause, the root cause of your tinnitus, um, stress reduction, anxiety, sleep, attention, concentration. The one-on-one -on -one coaching is excellent to help your brain habituate on that front. So that's the foundation, those two elements. And we've last year we saw uh, over 3,000 individuals, over 3,000 patients via the telehealth model, focusing on just that. So as we showed in the previous slide, what we're doing is really working, and it makes me excited to host this Relief Summit and to bring us all together to learn, hey, what are the strategies that actually work? If you can come out of this summit with a handful of those strategies, I'll be very happy. On top of the sound therapy and the CBT, a list of relaxation strategies is another helpful tip. I'm going to feature some individuals here. If they might, they may even be here in the Relief Summit Live. Um, all these individuals have given their time, to given back to the tinnitus community by providing one-on-one -on -one, um, podcast episodes. So they've recorded their story, their tinnitus success story. It's on YouTube for free. You can watch anytime in depth. I'm, I'm simply sampling how it's not only sound therapy devices on the ears 
and one-on-one -on -one coaching, but it's also some other tips. One tip is having a list of relaxation strategies, keeping these visible in your house, a visible list of things you can do to help relax yourself, settle the mind, settle the body. This settles the central nervous system and promotes habituation. Second helpful tip is going to be observing the mind and the body. So Melinda is a credit officer who, when I think of someone who really took this seriously, it's Melinda. And additionally, when I think of someone who took the relaxation strategy seriously, it's James. So these are patients who explain their whole story and any little tip or trick you can take and implement and create into a habit going to be extremely helpful observing our thoughts, observing the physical sensations in our body, not being attached to them. That is the goal. And Melinda did this very well and it helped her reduce her tinnitus along with the sound therapy devices on her ears and working in a one-on-one -on -one domain with one of our audiologists at Treble Health. John is a patient who uh, I was working with uh, earlier on with Treble Health and his new hobby he learned because of tinnitus, he shares this in the podcast episode, is meditation and guided breathing relaxation strategies. So he implemented guided breathing in the morning, guided breathing in the middle of the day. He followed the seven-day tinnitus meditation challenge that I created, and he took it very seriously. He found that it not only helped him reduce his tinnitus and habituate, but it also helped him create better work-life balance and create a more clear mind so that he can stay focused and alert. Another tip here is to use your sound therapy on a daily basis, make it a priority. As I said earlier, now you know sound therapy is helpful. If you just tell yourself, oh, I'm gonna, you may have thought, oh, well, I'll just use that when I feel like it, or I'll, I'll use that if my tinnitus gets worse. If you're here, you probably need to use this more constantly than that. And our recommendation, our top tip, is to use the sound therapy consistently, daily, and make it a priority. When you reach stage four of habituation, you don't need the sound therapy anymore. That's an important key that patients often get stuck on. They might think, will my tinnitus get worse over time? Do I need to use ear level devices forever? The answer is, we, the answer is usually not. Usually your tinnitus gets a lot better over time. Usually after you reach stage four of habituation, you don't need the devices any, well, when you reach stage four of habituation, you definitely don't need the devices anymore. Um, most patients do get to that stage four habituation. So have hope, keep that really just close to you of acknowledging that and use sound therapy on a daily basis. Another pro tip here from our team is using more constructive phrases. So instead of saying, my tinnitus is killing me right now, or I can't live with this. You can replace those thoughts or those words with more constructive phrases. Instead of I can't live with this, you can say or tell yourself, this is very loud right now and I'm doing a good job at just trying to stay present. You can tell yourself instead of this tinnitus is killing me right now, you can say, I'm struggling right now, this is challenging but I will get through this and I will not give up. That may seem very simple. And someone who really proved that this works is Toddy, who had a rather complex case of tinnitus with hearing loss and was able to get to a much better degree of tinnitus because of these methods, as well as sound therapy on the ear for her hearing. So I'm happy to say that this presentation has come to an end and we're now transitioning into the live Q&A. So um, now I'm going to answer your questions and I'm really excited for all the questions you guys had. Um, again, my name is Dr. Ben Thompson, I'm with Treble Health. So now's a great time to go in the Q&A, ask your question, and I'm gonna spend as much time as I can answering them here tonight. Um, for those of you who want to find, find more information about me or what we do at Treble Health, you can go to our website, treblehealth.com. Uh, we will include that in the in the chat right here. Uh, you can even answer some basic questions and sign up for a free consultation with our team. That's something that uh, we're offering here tonight. Uh, we'll include the link here of how you can sign up for that. Um, are any other audiologists in the room? 
uh, would, would love to know. So I can go ahead and start uh, answering any questions that come up. And in the chat right now, um, you'll see I'm going to drop in the link to um, schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with us. So if you were interested in any of the things I've spoken about, if you were interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching or getting in-ear devices for sound therapy treatment, uh, we do work nationwide. We have a team of talented audiologists that are specialized in tinnitus. We work via telehealth. So find that link there in the chat and you're more than welcome to schedule a free consultation where we can answer your questions in detail, help you find the cause of your tinnitus and provide some recommendations for relief. The free consultation is about 20 minutes. Um, that was asked by Simone in the chat. Um, all right, let's start with the first question. Um, first, I just wanna acknowledge James Spencer comments that the summit is beyond outstanding, that he'll be back tomorrow. He's, he's grateful for me, my incredible team, and all of our work. James is very kind, that makes me um, just very grateful for you as well. Before we ask, before we answer the first questions, while we're all here, let's just review. Um, we just went through this whole schedule for Wednesday, six amazing presentations. We're now transitioning into tomorrow, um, Feb Thursday, February 9th. So we have Dirk DeRitter, neurosurgeon, very talented, highly recommended. We have Hazel Goodhart from Tinnitus Talk and Tinnitus Hub. We have Dr. Tracy Peck Holcomb from Treble Health. Those presentations in the middle of the day are going to be outstanding. And then in the late afternoon, early evening, um, this is not something to miss. You have the founder of Dr. Powell Jastroboff. I don't think he's going to be offering to do these kinds of presentations for many more years, but he's always surprised me how he keeps showing up even into his later years of life of how many presentations he's, he's giving. He's a very kind man who gives his time and wants you to get better. Um, he's my main mentor and I studied with him under tinnitus retraining therapy. So he's actually joining us live on Zoom to talk about the history of tinnitus retraining therapy and why it's still a leading treatment method for tinnitus. And then after that, I'm going to explain uh, the evidence-based tinnitus treatment that I learned from the best ENT doctors in the world. This is going back to uh, last year when I attended a conference and it's a, a protocol that was recommended by these global ENT expert doctors. So I took that information and have made it um, easy to understand for you who's going to join us tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. All right, now that we've gone through that, let's start to um, answer some questions. And if any other audiologists here from Treble want to turn their video on or just their audio on and um, let me know of any questions, then I'd be glad to answer them. Hi, Ben. Um, I see a Hello, question. Hello, Dr. Ramsey. Hi, um, <clears throat> there's a question from Giovanni. What are the biggest challenges with considering a gone forever or a totally quiet cure as a realistic possibility in the next 30 years? I think that the biggest challenge is finding what method is going to get us there. So bimodal stimulation, you might say, well, after today's presentations, bimodal stimulation seems like it's the most promising, but the data on that does not bring us to a zero out of 10, a zero tinnitus. Um, so I would say that bimodal stimulation is a, another treatment we can use in our toolkit, but right now it's not that kind of dramatic tinnitus is completely gone effect that we all want, of course, and and I know that there's there might be some pushback and and some negative thoughts in the community of no certain groups don't want that don't buy into that rhetoric any any reasonable scientist doctor person in our industry wants all of you to get better um, other challenges over the next thirty years I mean it's really going to be defining what modality can do it Odo three one three injections in the ear failed the um, hair cell regeneration, it's just been really hard. That's been, they've been trying to do that for decades. Taking a medication for tinnitus to change the brain, that's, that doesn't seem very promising either. Um, a surgery inside of the head to, a, to adjust the neurons in the brain, that seems too invasive and hasn't shown great results. 
So I would say um, to answer the question, it's the mechanism of what modality can actually change tinnitus for most people. It's deep in the brain, but how do we restructure the brain cells without opening up the head and doing some fancy mm -hmm. neuro, neuro, um, neurosurgery? So that's my answer that finding the right modality which also means understanding the true mechanism. Um, that will be, um, any researcher that does that will be well known in history. Okay, and just to piggyback on that, there's been comments in the chat regarding uh, opinion on stem cells, which is along the lines of. Correct, I would say stem cells is experimental at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some patients try it, mixed success to little success. Um, stem cell is not something that's leading the pack in terms of the research. It was not brought up tonight for that reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's been multiple questions on uh, the neosensory device and neosensory mm -hmm. is a an experimental form of bimodal stimulation. It was not mentioned in Dr. Lim's presentation. I did not mention it in my presentations. I will let I will let that speak for itself. If it's working for you, that's great. If it has worked for others, that's great. But at this time, Treble Health and our audiology team, we're not recommending the neosensory device as a, a proven treatment for tinnitus. Any other questions that you think are good for me to answer, Dr. Ramsey? I'm looking through them now. Um, um, there's been questions regarding sleep and insomnia. So here would be one. How long do most people experience insomnia with tinnitus, when tinnitus first emerges? My insomnia has been pretty extreme for a few months, and I'm trying to determine if it is only the tinnitus that is causing it. That's, then, that's the right question to ask yourself because um, number one, why is the tinnitus there in the first place? Is there some other medical medical system, medical condition that the tinnitus is related to? Could that also be affecting sleep or uh, restlessness? And then if you're noticing sleep difficulty with tinnitus, there's two sides to this coin. Number one is how can I make this better now? How can I manage this now? Number two is, um, what is the cause of this and how can I get to the root cause of this to try to improve it? Um, I'll just say right now that there's nothing wrong with following your doctor's recommendations ever. There's nothing wrong with that ever, okay? That means you're doing your best, but especially with sleep, take any improvement you can get. Be cautious about certain medications that may be habit forming or um, aggressive, but work with your doctor, whatever can get you to have normal sleeping patterns in the short term is okay with me. And you'll be able to habituate better if you're sleeping well. Just be cautious with certain medications, the benzodiazepine family, because um, you, you, you may fall into the trap of, of doing that in the short term, that becomes your habit and then it's hard to get off of, but still consult with your doctor, anything they recommend, neurologist as well, anything they recommend for sleep, I would give it a go and try it and work with your audiologist as well for a second opinion. Okay. And then with that, some questions about ginkgo biloba and you might want to address uh, bioflavonoids as well. Absolutely. So I've personally looked at all of the research on herbal supplements, um, bioflavonoids, ginkgo biloba, um, I did a YouTube video on this that has tens of thousands of views. We wrote a blog article about this that's been uh, featured and recommended. And there's no herbal supplement that's been scientifically proven for tinnitus relief. Um, also the, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, they don't, uh, they don't monitor who's, who's marketing which of these herbal supplements for medical conditions. What that essentially means, it's, it's a wild west out there. So someone can say that their product does something for tinnitus. And there's essentially no, no one to come back and say, that's a false claim. So just be really cautious about any online marketing you see for certain tinnitus products, but especially herbal supplements. Now that said, there's definitely been some research that's 
made us wonder, hey, ginkgo biloba, biloba is doing something in certain patients that just hasn't been that convincing when it's been restudied and tried again. Same with bioflavonoids. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, and, and we'll make one more mention that um, for anyone who has ind individual questions that wants to speak with a tinnitus expert from our team, um, we'll drop, I dropped the link in the chat um, under the Zoom chat here. So anyone is welcome to um, sign up for that. And if you're within the United States, we'll be able to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with you. We're not able to see patients outside of the United States at this time. Apologies if that applies to you. I think I have time. I think I have time for just uh, one or two more questions, Dr. Ramsey. So, okay, sure. Best, what are uh, the best ones you got? Okay. Uh, why does my tinnitus increase when I exercise? Um, your tinnitus increases when you exercise. Your why does your tinnitus increase when you exercise? Mm -hmm. This is something that I don't have a great answer to, and. I, I personally don't know. I'm just going to say that outright. I personally don't know why your tinnitus gets worse when you exercise. Cardiovascular stress is a thing. There's certain hormone systems that are changing in your body when you exercise, and that can lead to louder tinnitus. I've experienced that personally myself. I don't right now have a good scientific medical answer as to why. Okay. How does eustachian tube dysfunction influence tinnitus? Yeah, great question. So eustachian tube dysfunction, the little tube behind the eardrums, when I equalize, when I open my jaw, I'll notice some crackling or eustachian tube changing, and that equalizes the pressure behind the eardrum. If my eustachian tubes are clogged, it can lead to a 10 to 20% increase in tinnitus, in my opinion. And if the eustachian tubes are really, really bothered, it can create a, a mild hearing loss, which can additionally add more, uh, more restriction of sound and essentially louder tinnitus. And I see Angie in the chat here who gives us a shout out. Thanks so much, Angie. Hope you're gonna come back tomorrow. Um, Charlotte, you asked, do sinus problems affect tinnitus? Absolutely. Eustachian tube is one of the main reasons how your sinus problems can affect tinnitus. Um, just the nose itself, if you have a you know runny nose, if you have other nasal, conge nasal congestion issues, it doesn't always affect the eustachian tube and tinnitus, but sometimes it can. That's, that's, why, we, that's why we have a close relationships with ENT doctors uh, because they work so closely with those elements. Uh, okay, I have one more question. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pick one myself, okay? I'm just gonna go through here. Um, all right, so my question, my question that I'm gonna pick, last question of the day goes out to Jim. Jim asks um, how to prevent more tinnitus, how to prevent hearing loss and how to prevent tinnitus spikes by using uh, earplugs and hearing protection. So there's different, uh, Jim asks, any suggestions on loud noise earplugs, expensive fitted earplugs seem to make my tinnitus worse. Well, Jim, any earplugs in your ear should create an extra 10 decibels of hearing loss because that's the whole point. We, sorry, not hearing loss, but hearing protection. If I'm protecting myself with 10 decibels from my environment, that means my brain's hearing 10 decibels less. What do we know with tinnitus? It's loudest when we're in a quiet room and it's loudest when there's no other sounds going on. Also, those who have more degrees of hearing loss typically have a harder time bringing tinnitus down to zero. Now, if, if you have hearing loss, don't think what I, don't misinterpret what I just said. You can absolutely get better with tinnitus. But just in my own personal experience, you're likely to still have some mild tinnitus after a tinnitus treatment um, if you have a hearing loss because hearing loss itself makes it hard for your brain to hear silence because the sounds your ear is not hearing is what your brain makes up as uh, the tinnitus sound. So Jim, my advice would be play around with uh, reusable 
$40 earplugs that have different filter strengths and compare those to your musician plugs and use them sparingly. Use them when you're actually around loud noise. I would expect them to make your tinnitus worse, rather louder in the moment, because that's really what they're designed to do, block sounds, which in turn would give you more hearing loss. You'd hear more tinnitus. So um, a creative way around that, if it's just a light degree of loud noise, would be um, something like headphones that does a little noise cancellating. But if you're really trying to protect your hearing, then you'll just have to accept that your tinnitus is a bit louder when you have those earplugs in. Uh, and hopefully that gets you on the right foot. I want to give a big shout out to um, Dr. Ramsey Poindexter, Dr. Mark Partain, Dr. Tracy Peck Holcomb, who are the audiologists that have been engaging here in the chat as well as Danielle Paulela, who is our marketing manager and I work very closely with every day um, to make the YouTube channel run, to make the blog articles run, to make the emails go out. So I just want to acknowledge the whole Treble Health team who is uh, here after hours um, showing up and being a big part of the Tinnitus Relief Summit. Um, guys, I really hope to see you tomorrow. As you can see on the screen, this is the schedule. So make sure to book it in your calendar and I'll be looking forward to seeing you all there um, especially for Dr. Tracy's talk, the four pillars of tinnitus treatment, sound, stress, sleep, and somatic, somatosensory, as well as Dr. Jasterboff and me going back to back, which is kind of like a dream come true for me. So thanks everyone. And really excited to just keep serving you guys and learning more about how we can help. Have a good night, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.